My guest today is Vincent René Lordy, a Canadian film director and screenwriter known for his grounded, dreamlike narratives. Now, his work is a testament to purposeful and deeply personal storytelling intended to make his audience reflect on themes such as mental health and childhood. Now, his short film, Invincible, is an ode to the memory of Marc Antoine Bigny, and it depicts the tale of a young man yearning for his freedom. Now, the film has had a very successful festival season, including winning Best Live Action Short Film at Chicago Children's Film Festival and Rendezvous Quebec Cinema, and the film won the Special Jury Prize at the clermont Ferrand Film Festival and has since garnered several international accolades. Now, inspired by a true story, the short film Invincible recounts the last 48 hours in the life of Marc Antoine Beigny, a 14-year-old boy on a desperate quest for freedom. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome writer-director Vincent René Lordy and his short film, his Oscar shortlisted short film, Invincible, to the show. Welcome, Vincent. Hi, hi. Thank you so much for uh, welcoming me. This is an honor. Thank you. Well, it's great to have you, and I've got to kind of start right off the bat here. When did you get interested in being a filmmaker? Uh, wow, that's a good question. I think I think I've always been very interested in filmmaking since I'm very young, and even when I didn't really know that, I was uh, when I was really young. I remember vividly, like always dreaming about different narrative, and it was like I was the, the, the craziest kind of film that I was imagining, like uh, superheroes and and just like uh, like James Bond, but my type of James Bond, the Canadian type of James Bond. So it was it was like uh, very special, and I was really 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 young when this happened. And the crazy thing, and I think it's is, is that it, it followed, it stayed with me for a very long time, and and even today, even every time I'm 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 listening to music or just walking in the street, I these kind of stories always happen in my head. And so when I was in high school, I, I wanted actually to be an actor. Uh, truth is, I understood I also was, I was really, really shy. And, and so I was doing all the, all the shows in my school, but eventually I was like, no, that's not for me. And then I, I decided to, to start studying uh, television and also cinema. And, and I went into film production at, at the University of Concordia in Montreal, and, and then the rest is history. But yeah, it was, I, think, I think it's all started really, really young. And of course, like being in a family that was lis- were listening to a uh, watching story, a lot of movies are kind of good, like, like uh, art films and very interesting cinema from all around the world. I was very fortunate about that. And yeah, that's how it happened. Yeah, I always, boy, years ago, I was always in love with uh, foreign language films. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. pe- people found it difficult to read subtitles, but I loved it because it just opened up a whole new world of film and, and cinema. And you kind of understand or try to understand what other filmmakers are doing and thinking. You know, for you, do you ever just walk down the street and maybe uh, see something ahead of you and thinking, that would make a great shot? <laughs> Of course, yeah, I th- yeah, it, it happens a lot, and, and I'm trying to take pictures when this happens. But it's also like you just mentioned. Like I think when, in in Quebec, we have sometimes because we're the only province in North America that speaks French, right? And we have this bad habit of of uh, doubling movies with French uh, a voice. And but I, I think I was also happy because when I was young, we were listening always in the original language with subtitles, like you just mentioned. So that was like some things that I was I think. Uh, I think when you hear the real voice and you hear the 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 again yeah, foreign language, it's just like so rich. It becomes the the real movie. So it was yeah, I was happy about that. You know, it's kind of funny to even bring up the subject of subtitles because now you know we all know that when you're on social media and you have mm-hmm. let's say your earpods in and it's nighttime and you don't want to disturb anybody, everybody's putting subtitles on all their videos, so everybody's getting used to reading along. And uh, I think that may actually uh, make foreign films uh, making a, a, a large comeback. So uh, I guess we got to thank social media for that. But I've got to ask you about your film, Invincible. Uh, tell us who Marc Antoine Beigny is. Yeah, so it's, um, 
it, he was my friend um, f uh, during high school, and we were really, really close to each other. Um, and then, uh, he, unfortunately, Marc Antoine, at the age of 14, he passed away after a very, very tragic uh, event. He, he, he was in a juvenile center for a year. He escaped. He stole a car, followed by police chase, and then the, the car ended up in the in a river in my city in, in, in Montreal. And as you can probably imagine, this event really affected all my community. We were a very small neighborhood and it really affected everybody. It also affected me. And, and at that moment, I thought it was an accident. And everybody thought the same thing. Um, I think it was the word that was everybody was saying. But then eventually, um, five years ago, this story was still very, really it stayed with me for such a long time. And I kept coming back to that story. And so I decided to contact the family again of Mark and his friends too. And I had coffee with them separately. And one of the first things that actually his dad told me was that it was probably more a suicide than it was an accident. So I understand that I didn't really know my friend really well. Um, and so I decided to get to know him a bit better by doing a lot of research, um, having more discussion with his, the, the people that knew him at the time, um, and also starting to meet a health professional, mental health professional, to understand what really happened. Because at the end of the day, his story is about mental health and is about something that he was struggling with, but that the society at that time didn't know really how to help him. And so that's why I decided to make a film about that 48 hours before he passed away. You know, I've done numerous interviews based on the subject of suicide. Mm -hmm. And there's a common denominator with all of them. No one ever saw it coming. Most people never saw the signs because the signs with everybody is going to be different. And mm -hmm. which I believe, which is why it's so hard for those that are left here to deal with the aftermath, to deal with the memory and trying to, some try to find closure and some people never get closure because it's just so difficult to understand. Your mm -hmm. film Invincible, you literally place the audience within Marc Antoine's life. I mean, it's almost like we were wearing his shoes from beginning to end. And and it was and it was it was a dramatic ride in this film and um, mm -hmm. I had to watch it a few times to grasp because this is a I'm not gonna it's not a dark I'm not gonna call it a dark film it's dramatic mm -hmm. um, it's powerful it's serious and it really for me I was like you I wanted to know more about Mark and mm -hmm. you know it you know because he was in the juvenile detention center do you know why mark was sent there mhm mm yeah of course it's it's a um, what really happened is a series of events that happened before um, he was sent to a juvenile center and i'm going to i'm going to be honest i f i felt after doing all this research that these events weren't the reason why he was feeling like that. It was just action that it was making to kind of, it was a cry for help. It was, it was just very kind of, it was things that would, um, would, um, get the attention of the police, like, uh, selling drugs and, and, and just st st stealing things and, and sometimes doing things that were really, really dangerous for him as well. And so eventually for his parents and, and, you know, they tried to help him, but eventually they didn't know how to help him anymore. And, and so that's why he was sent in a juvenile center, but to, to get back to what you're saying, mm -hmm. and, and I totally agree with you is that the, the, the aftermath of suicide is, is very important too, when it comes to the people that know the, um, the, the, to know that the, the, the people around, around them. Right. And in my case, I made the movie and the, the final scene of the film, I'm not going to say too much, but the final scene of the film is really about that is really about the people that are going to have to live with that, which is his family for the rest of their life. It's a grief that will stay with them. And it's really important to talk about that too, because I think that 
and I'm, I don't want to take too much time, but I think no, that take your time. was, <laughs> I think, I think that Mark, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I think that, uh, Mark was in a very dark place at that moment, just before he passed away. He was in a place where he felt like he had nowhere to belong. He, he belonged nowhere. He didn't know where to, how to talk to people and how to express his emotion. And in, in his, his mind, he thought that it would always be the same thing. It would always be the same thing for the rest of his life. For for the rest of his life, sorry, he thought that he would stay in a prison for the rest of his life. Which means that if it's if not the juvenile center, it would be somewhere else. But he would never feel his place. And in a way, when he escaped, he was finally at his place. He was at, he was free. And me, it's I know it's dramatic. It is very very sad. But in a way, he was at a place to belong at the end. For, so, so, so the end of the film is really more about his parents and his sister more than about him. Yeah, you know, um, I think when I was, I think I was in the sixth grade, and my best friend's sister committed suicide. And at that time, when you're at that age, you don't really understand what that means. You don't understand what the aftermath is going to be like for that family. And, you know, I've, I really felt for Mark, you know, in this film. And, and, I, and I had to look at this film in different ways from my perspective because there's so many elements to look at. And like you said, you know, Mark, in a way, was trying to find a place to belong. No one, mm -hmm. he didn't know how to communicate what he was feeling inside, uh, mentally, maybe what he was dealing with. And as I was looking at that area in the film, uh, did you do any type of research on juvenile detention? Because what are the psychological effects of teens in juvenile detention? And uh, because some of them could, you know, if they were there, if they were 14, 15, 16, some of them, they're not going to get out till they're 18. If not, they mm -hmm. may be transferred to a, to an adult prison. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, first, I want to say, I'm, I'm sorry to, to hear that, um, this happened to someone you knew when you were young. Um, I, I know how impactful this can be for, for even so, sometimes to someone who's very, very young as well. Um, but, and, and to answer your question, yes, I did a lot of research. I think for me, the, the, the long, the, the, the process of making that film was doing many months and, and almost two years actually of research of meeting people who are working in a juvenile center, but also people working for, um, uh, man, I, I, as I was saying, mental health professional and his family and everybody around him. I think truth is, I don't think, um, Juvenile center are the same in Canada and Quebec that they are the same in the U.S. So I don't want to speak for like every type of juvenile center. In in, in my case, I think that and and I, after meeting all of these people work, working there, I think that they're doing their best. Of obviously there is bad people everywhere, but I think they are doing their best. But they don't have don't, they don't they don't have the tool to help kids that are dealing that are struggling with mental health issues. And that's still the case. That was the case. Uh, uh, 10 years ago, um, it's actually even more like uh, 16 years ago, but it, it's, it's, um, it's still the case today. Uh, usually when a kid is doing bad stuff, um, uh, they are saying that he's, he's, he or she is just a delinquent. She, she is immature and she's going to get better or he's going to get better when he gets older. And I was the same for Mark. They, they thought he would be, he would be fine eventually, but they were wrong. And they're, they're, they are wrong most of the time. Um, usually someone who is doing bad, I mean, doing stuff that are seen by society as, as bad is a cry for help is, is, uh, and I think it's really important to talk about that. And, 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 and just to finalize on that subject, I think it's, um, it was a, it, it was important for me to say that it's not anybody's fault. It's not specifically the fault of the juvenile center or his friends or his parents it's kind of a more of a society issue at that point and 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 um i i, I it was important for me to understand that in the movie yeah you know 
in the film you show where he has a weekend pass. You know, he can, you know the family goes to the lake, having fun, swimming. Then it's time to go back. Uh, mm -hmm. His father asked him, are you sure that you want to go back now? Or, you know, you want to stay a couple of extra days? So, yeah, I can see where, you know, the family is, you know, keeping him part of the family. They're not like just shoving him into the de juvenile detention center. He had a choice that he could spend a little bit more time with his parents before going back to fulfill whatever sentence that they had given him for, you know, deeds that he did out in, in society. So I thought, okay, there's a love there from his family. He was having mm -hmm. fun with his sister. They were swimming in the lake. But boy, when he went walking through the door, walking through the gates of that juvenile center, it was night and day. The mental mm -hmm. health aspect went from fun and joy to dark and angry. Mm -hmm. It was it was uh, always the important moment with that film was really that that transition from his weekend with his family to his to him coming back to the juvenile center. What really happened, just to uh, um, make it short, is that he was at the end of his stay at the juvenile center, um, and at that point, they allowed him to sometimes have weekends with his family, but he always had to come back on a Monday, uh, a Sunday evening. And so after spending a beautiful weekend with his family, they drove him back to the juvenile center. And for him, it, this is not a juvenile center. He, it, this is a prison. This is a place when he cannot breathe. And so that kind of it's I know it's kind of a long moment, right? There's like the moment in the car and then the moment of him coming out of the car, walking in the go long hallway and being checked by the officer but all of this moment you really see him slowly drawing uh, uh, drawing right this is a good word but anyway it's uh, so you see him uh going into a very, very dark dark place until he's finally in his room and if you notice when he gets in this room you there's almost silence the, the silence means no air there's no there's no kind of way he can really be himself in that in that uh, in that room you know and that's that, that, that yeah that scene when he comes back and he enters his room they lock the door behind him he he walks <clears throat> he walks over to the window to look out the window but the window it, is not clean it's very opaque you can you probably wouldn't even be able to see anything but just the light of the sun that would that was coming through. The fan wasn't working. It was hot. And it was it was the scene to where it depicted like his as he was in that room, that life was closing in on him. Like you said, mm -hmm. he couldn't breathe. There wasn't a breeze. He was hot. It was sweaty. And being in that in that moment of being uncomfortable, his anger rose up inside of him. He goes from being at the lake and enjoying the cool water and, and laughing and playing, mm -hmm. and now he's in this, you know, windless room that is hot and like and I think Mark felt that everything was closing in on him. It was it was a powerful scene. Thank you. It, it was, um, you know, that moment in his room is tricky because um, uh, we shot in the actual, in a, in a real juvenile center, in, in the same one that the real event happened. Uh, it's really a big one. It's not the exact same room, but all the rooms are really similar. And to to uh, give you a little bit of a behind the scene, like we 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 really close the door on on the, the, the operator, camera operator, and and the, the sound um, person. And then there was obviously Leo Kim who was playing Mark. And there was this long sequence shot and they were all feeling this kind of claustrophobia where they cannot go anywhere. And it's very, very thick walls, right? So it's like how this is kind of real too. Like this is, this make, this scene make, the, the, the way we filmed this scene made it a little bit more 
made it a little bit real as well. And um, yeah, I think like, as you just mentioned, he was outside and he was feeling like he was, he was, he could breathe and he could be himself. And now he's inside. And what do you do when you cannot do something you dream of? And that was his reaction. His reaction was he would never think about the consequences, never. So that's why he he decided to do what he decided to do in that in that and uh, in, in his bedroom. And I don't want to say too much. About no, that, no, 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 no. I, I understand what you're saying, and, and I can't even imagine with the camera operator, the sound guy, and then the young man, the actor, to be in that room with the door closed mentally, when they got out of that room, they were probably thinking, how does someone deal with being in that environment for at least a year and you're being told Mm -hmm. what to do 24 hours a day? Yeah. I mean, that's the reason, and I agree with you. I think these juvenile centers, they need to have much improved mental health uh, counselors and abilities and and to find new ways because teenagers are still at that age where they don't know everything, even though they think they do. They don't know everything, but they need to be heard. They need to be listened to. They need mm-hmm. to be counseled in the correct way to, you know, help them to know that, you know, when they do become an adult or even when they get out, that there are no limits to life, that you you can mm-hmm. be what you want to be um, and, and achieve great things. They need to be encouraged. They need to be inspired and motivated. Yeah, sure. You're in a, a detention center. It Treat it like a hiccup in life. It's just a season. Get through the season, but better yourself before you get out. And I think that really relies on, you know, getting better uh, educated counselors that really understand and really extend a hand of, well, the only thing I can say is to show, to show more love, mercy, grace, and compassion all at the same time. But Vincent, there is a moment in this film, I think in a way it's a turning point. So when Mm -hmm. Luke told Mark as he sit, sits in the office, one can leave by the front door or they can leave by the back door. That was a powerful mm-hmm. moment. Thank you. Yeah, that was uh, that that sentence really came from a counselor who was with us for the whole process and for the whole research as well. And he's someone that works at the juvenile center too. Um, and that also was there during the period of time where Mac was there. And, and, and he told us, this exact thing where when you live by the in the back door you will you are not able to go back to your family you're not able to go back to your close ones because the 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 juvenile center will come back for to uh, to get you and 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 it will be with the police and it's not it's not pretty it's not nice and so you always have to go back to the juvenile center if you leave from the back door. When it's from the front door it's another it's a totally different uh, way of seeing it. But of course, the front door is longer and needs more work and needs, and needs, as you just mentioned, to follow the rules one by one. And if you don't, then you stay there longer. So it's just kind of like an ugly way of seeing it. But again, I know that I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to like, I don't want to say that everybody who works there are, are, are doing the right no, thing. No, no, no. I get you, it. You, you know, you know, I get it yeah. because we have to understand too. Everybody's human. Mm -hmm. Counselors are human. Even they will have a bad day. They will go to work. They won't care about anything or anybody except maybe whatever personal problem they're dealing with. And it can come Mm -hmm. across to those that are within the center and they can come across as uncaring and it's just called life. And, and I, and I understand that. Uh, with Mark, though, I was kind of wondering how much time did he have left to serve at the center? It's um, it's very sad, actually. He had uh, less than a week, less than a week, and and I and I 
was struggling in the script to make the audience understand that. But then I, after a lot of rewriting, rewriting, I decided that it wasn't that important. The line was there originally in the script to understand it had only two days. But then I, I thought it was probably making it even more like of a what what effect like why did he do that why did he t- did he make that decision of, of of escaping because for everybody at that time we all didn't understand what he could have stayed for two more days and get out and then and then be with his family yeah and that's where we go back to square one where we still don't understand why those <clears throat> that choose suicide and in Mark's story mirrors millions of people that were just on the edge of freedom and then may have not been able to actually see uh, or grasp what that freedom was going to be like. Even though they dreamed of having freedom, they decided to choose another way. Uh, and it's why it's so difficult to talk and understand about suicide because we don't know what Mark's thought process was, even though he was two days away from, from freedom as what society calls freedom. He may have thought mentally he was still trapped that once he got out, life wasn't really going to be any different. That's, that's, um, that was a little bit my conclusion and that's how I, my interpretation of what happened. But I think that, uh, unfortunately after, doing all of this research, one of the things that came back a lot was that, yeah, a lot of these kids, they don't see the out as being something interesting. They don't see coming out as to their family or to their friend as being optimistic or beautiful. It's usually quite dramatic, the, the condition of what, where they, are, they have to go back to. But in the case of Mark, he, he had a beautiful family, an incredible sister as well, and, and, and beautiful friend. But the, the truth is that he, he felt always kind of a, in a prison. He felt like no p- people weren't listening to him, uh, even if they were trying. Like they, there's just a, to go back to this idea of, of tools, they don't have the tools to help someone like him. Um, I hope that it will it will be addressed in the future. I don't know how is it uh, how is it in the in the states in, in Canada. It's it's not it's not addressed yet. It's been, and we have to talk about that a bit more. Yeah, I think with Canada and even the United States, it's still a difficult situation. I mm-hmm. am thankful though that the subject of mental health has been pushed to the forefront more than ever. And to have people like you that bring forth stories to highlight issues of mental health. And a lot, and you know, most, and as you know, most of these stories are not glamorous. They're not fun. Mm -hmm. It's reality. And sometimes reality hurts, but we Mm -hmm. do need to continue to talk about it to make mental health aware and some way, somehow learn to start seeing some of the signs. And as a society, we need to learn to listen more. Uh, We need to get off our phones. We need to, when we see somebody that maybe something's not right, we need to just say, Hey, is there something wrong? You can talk to me. Just let it out, you know, let them be free with their words and just kind of let it go from there. But you have produced a very powerful film. And I have to ask, what was the casting process like for this film? Because there's a lot of characters there. There's a lot of teenagers. How did you put all that together? Uh, Thank you. It's, uh, yeah, we we worked for many months to find first uh, our our mark. Uh, Like we needed to to know who that person would be. Um, And once we found him, um, he, when he entered, when Lil Kim entered the the, the casting room, we were just struck by his energy because he was just, um, just so close to his emotion. And that was exactly what, what I was looking for. And I think in his own way, he understood Mark. He knew how, he knew, he knew a little bit what it was to be in his position. I don't want to say too much about that, but it was, it was kind of interesting and powerful to see. 
Um, he never played in front of a camera ever in his in his life. Um, I think he did maybe one extra once, but that was it. that was it. So we worked a lot together for almost two years. We uh, two two years, sorry, two months. Um, we saw each other every week, and we rehearsed every scene. We rewrote the film together as well. Um, and then for the the rest of the cast, uh, I wanted to work with. Uh, mostly with non-actors all the kids in the film are non-actors and all the adults are professional actors and that kind of energy was very nice was very interesting to see because they were feeding from each other the non-actors they they come with something honest and they come with something beautiful and true but uh, they don't have the experience to be on set and the, the 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 older ones they had all this experience but to to get back to kind of what is or like just the first the first glimpse of acting and what is it to just be in front of a camera for the first time they kind of got to work out around that and it was very beautiful to see um um yeah yeah you know, so uh, that was i have the, and this is what i loved about this oscar season they have mm -hmm. been. There are so many films, and, and and I and I and I'm partial to short films. But with the short films, there have been so many first time directors. There are first time actors. I mean, it could be like you said, it could be teenagers, it could be a child, an adult, first time ever in front of the camera. Mm -hmm. And I love the realism because they're not trained. And they're basically following the directions and trying to understand how the whole process works. But some of these performances this season have been absolutely outstanding. But I love it. I love the fact that all of these people have never done this before. And, mm. and as you were explaining it, I was thinking, wow, what if, what if Mark would have had the opportunity to be in front of a camera for the very first time. It may have ignited a whole new world for him and to realize that it gave him hope that there was, wow, there is something in this world that maybe I could do. And that's one mm -hmm. thing I like about these first time actors. A lot of them, now they're bit by the bug. And, and for a yeah. lot of them, I think it now has placed that dream into their heart that they can do something incredible and amazing and so mm -hmm. i you know for you i agree with you i'm glad that you know all of the teenagers in this movie this was their first time in front of the camera it's beautiful they they loved it and and, and you know leo kim now is is acting a lot and being asked for first role a lot where i'm from uh in quebec and so i feel i i, I see that as something so uh moving and touching and i think that yeah it's uh in in a i've never asked myself that question but that's very interesting i i, I would have loved to see actually the real mac in front of a camera i think he would have been a fantastic actor and probably as well um i think he would he would have probably loved that because because he, you know, when it's the good role, of course, but I think it, it would allow him to maybe um, to be to play, and which is which is important for at this age. And I had a discussion about that yesterday. But yeah, this uh, this idea of like uh, uh, ch children, teenager, they like to play, and that you know, uh, Mark loved to play as well. Sometimes he was taking it too far, but he loved to to do that, and probably that he would have been a, a great actor. Yeah. Yes, and and I have to I have to tell you one of the one of the things that I love about your direction and your writing of this film, and it's one of these elements that I've seen in other films, but I always love it because it sets the stage for the whole film. When you start the film with a scene coming from the end. Mm -hmm. it's like okay what's going on and then you go back in time and then as the film moves towards the end then we're back to that original scene mm -hmm. I love films that do that mm -hmm. and I think you know your film it's cinematography it's beautiful it's gritty it's 
It has a very powerful emotion that is there that it, that even it carries the characters, but then also the characters carry it as well. And yeah. from your storytelling to the cinematography to the acting, it is it's a beautiful film. It's a powerful film, and and you absolutely deserve to be Oscar shortlisted. Thank you, thank you so much. It's a uh, it was a um, you know a, a big teamwork with so many people that put so much love in that project. It took us nearly five years to just show it to uh, to people here in Montreal and then to festival around the world. So it's like it's uh, I'm I'm really moved by all this love that is coming uh, with this shirtless nomination. Uh, I mean, yeah, shirtless. Uh, uh, I guess yeah, I, we can say it's a shortlist nomination, right? It's yeah. it's it's. Uh, hey, the way I look at it is, I, I tell everybody, if you make it, if you're qualified, if you end up on the shortlist, start dreaming about that nomination. <laughs> so yeah, 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 in a way, you got nominated on the shortlist, and you know, and rightly so. But what has been the audience's reaction to this film? Mm, the, the audience is. is it's been very special. I'm going to say that because I thought that I was making a film about someone that I really, someone that was really close to me. And I was a little bit afraid that it would maybe be a bit too far for other people, mostly to, in other language, right? We, we show this and, and, uh, and all over the world. And, and, um, one of the things that really, really struck me was after that, because I, I went to different screenings and after that, people were coming to me and saying um, that they either knew someone like like Mark or they, they were him when they were young. I think that it's a very universal thing to be a kid, to be a teenager and to not be uh, listened to. To not be understand by other by by older people by other people around them. So for me, it was just beautiful to see that people were really connecting with us. Sorry, no matter the language, no matter the culture, where they were from or the age, it was kind of um, it was yeah, it was very touching. And and from young people to to very um, you know um, um, adult and yeah yeah. So well, thanks for asking that because I I, I I love to see that. And. One of the other things that I noticed, what makes this film so powerful is it's not, it doesn't have a whole lot of dialogue, but it has the dialogue that's important. So mm -hmm. people from, as they watch it from beginning to end, you could literally follow this whole story if not one word was said. So that makes the cinematography, the camera work, excellent and it works that the, mm -hmm. the characters work and and i've seen films where there's no dialogue and you could literally you can literally in your mind go i know what's going on i know what's happening and you enjoy mm -hmm. the film and to me that makes this particular film very powerful because of you know there's not a whole lot of dialogue but it's there for a reason and you waste yeah. you Vincent, you did not waste one minute in this film. You did it perfectly. Thank you. It's, it's a long film, as you probably know. It's thirty <laughs> minutes, but I think that um, I think that I, I originally was longer. Just so you know, it was almost like forty minutes, and we cut it to thirty. And I felt like, okay, that's I cannot cut more than that. I, it has to be the exact time that it is right now. But um, you know, I, I for me, dialogues are not necessary unless um I, I unless I cannot say what I have to say with visuals with an image with a framing so I was I was like always thinking when I was writing the script can I say that with a, with a look with a smile with uh, um just yeah just a, 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 a one type of framing that is showing something in a different way in a point of view or anything like that so it's like I, I, I I'm always thinking like that because I'm not a big fan of dialogues I think they can be um hard to understand uh and and uh, and and it's like you know sometimes dialogues can be a bit cheesy as well so yeah i think that i worked a lot with my cinematographer alex omno and you mentioned the visual style and we he's my longtime collaborator we've been working together for uh, almost eight years since i was in 
uh, university and I think this film was as much impor important to him as it was for, as, as it was for me so what we what we did is that we decided to do um, a visual style that is much more grounded and the, the camera are usually very on, like on a tripod stable four tree ratio and the reason of that is we wanted the audience to feel like we are trapped with Lil Kim. So the, so the actor, the actor, Lil Kim, or the other people who were playing in the film, they had to stay inside that very, very uh, um, a small frame and they cannot get out. And as soon as they get out, they have to go to go back in to their position. And so that was helping the acting, that was helping also the audience to feel the same um, as, as Leo Kim, a lot of people came out of the screenings and said, oh my God, we feel so, we felt so close to him. And sometimes I wanted the camera to be a little bit further away. And I was like, no, the reason I decide that is to actually feel like we, we cannot get out of that. We cannot get out of the room. And, and that's, that was, that was, you know, I've done on for a good, a good reason. Yeah. Well, tell, tell your cinematographer that he did a stellar job. Because one of the things that I kept noticing <clears throat> is the use of the shadows, the mm -hmm. use of light in this film. Because to me, it, like you said, it gave this film a very particular look. And that look was not, did not change. You know, from the very mm. beginning to the very end, the, it had that. Even when they were at the lake, you know, and at the lake, it's it's refreshing, it's great. You can tell they're having fun, but there is still that look. And then you mentioned that framing, and I remember mm -hmm. <clears throat> Mark being in the water, and instead of taking the camera and filming him from an upward position down. You filmed mm -hmm. him slightly lower than the edge of the water where you're you're looking up at Mark. And I thought, mm -hmm. that is a shot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and even when his si when when the, the girl playing his sister is on the is on the wooden platform in the lake, that shot mm -hmm. is shot upwards towards her. Yeah. I just no, thank you. The camera work it's a, is, it, is amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really kind of always we we really thought together every shot and and I love to come ready on shoot and to storyboard everything and every feel every shot has as a reason and and usually it's always thinking okay how Mac would look at this how how do we do we look at the same eye as the character of Mac would and so. Um, you know, and, and the same for the visual and the texture of the image and, and the color, like we work a lot with warm and, and, and colder color, right? And the reason of that is, um, and it's very simple, I know, but it's kind of when he's outside, it's very warm, there's sun and it's hot, but even if it's hot, it's, it's welcoming. Uh, and it's, um, um, and, and when he's inside, it's very, it's very cold and it's dark and it's contra there's a lot of contrast, there's a lot of shadows. Um, and it's because you cannot breathe there. And as you can probably, you know, there's also the relationship with water and, and, uh, and fire in the film. Um, and so the, the reason why I use that is because fire and water are the two extremes, right? So it's like, um, and, 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 and the f who wins when we put water and fire against each other, it's always the water, but so Mac always place in the film with either water or fire and we play with that also when the, with the colors uh inside the film so when he's outside he's at his place he belongs so he's fire Bach is literally fire and at the end of the film he unfortunately gets um he he lose against the water so it's it's everything has a little bit of oh a reason oh my gosh uh, i can see that now because i was when i was looking when mark was in the the juvenile center there was always mm -hmm. this look of like this yellowish casting of light. Mm -hmm. Now I can see it being the flame. I can see when he was at the lake and towards the and it towards the end of the the film. Mm -hmm. Then you have that 
you have the effect of of water. It's maybe it's a hints of blue. It's a hints of green, and mm -hmm. but it's there. And now the whole film makes sense to me because I kept thinking the whole time, like I know because I noticed this yellow, slight orange casting, and now it makes sense of the of the of the of the water and the fire. Um, I just love yeah. these these creative things that all of you directors do. It, it's phenomenal, but this is a phenomenal film. Thank you. I, I think that it's, it's I'm, I'm also glad that you didn't notice that at first because it's important that it's very more in the subconscious. And, and of course, we, we, we made this decision for a good reason. At the end of the day, um, we don't want this to be something that is so obvious that uh, you just think about that and you just you don't think about the story. So I'm actually glad you're saying that. It's it's a good thing. Well, you are very welcome. And I have to say, what are you working on for 2024? 2024, um, you know, is, is exciting. So because I'm, I've been working on my first feature film and this is just the thing that keeps me up at night. Uh, I've been... Uh, 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 writing it with uh, co-writing it with a friend her name is Clara Milo and 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 this is just you know I don't want to say too much about the story but this is something very exciting that we are uh, we finished a first draft and people are seems to be interested by that story so I'm just kind of really eager to to um, you know to eventually it's probably not going to be soon but it's probably eventually I'm going to be able to show that to the world and again it treats about mental health but this time it's even more on a personal level um, uh, so yeah that's you know that's that, that's a project that I'm excited to jump on in 2024. Well, ho, ho, I, I wish you much success, you, you ladies and gentlemen, uh, Vincent Rene Lordy's film Invincible, Oscar shortlisted for the 2024 Academy Awards. That's a very high honor. And just think, Vincent, from now on, your film will always be mentioned with the word Oscar, no matter what happens. Yeah, yeah, I know. That's that's very uh, a big dream. Uh, and I want to say thank you so much for this interview. I, I love this question. I love to have this discussion with you. So thank you for taking the time to do this. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And oh, real quick, Vincent, um, is the general public, are they able to see Invincible at this time? Yes, so the film is available everywhere in North America on Omleto and in Europe on Arte. So uh, we can obviously we can send you the link and you can also share it with your audience. But the film is everywhere, everywhere is available everywhere in the world. Yeah, so ladies and gentlemen, if you just go to YouTube, go to Omleto, uh, you'll be able to watch Invincible. And this is one of the longer short films, but it's worth every minute. It is Vincent Rene Lordi's short film oscar shortlisted invincible it's a powerful film and i am so thankful for people like vincent that will highlight mental health because we need to keep that on the forefront uh in our society and help those that are struggling and if you if you just do something for me today as you're watching and listening to this interview with vincent take time to listen let's put our cell phones down and interact with with humans, maybe maybe it's our family, maybe it's our friends, maybe it's colleagues, or maybe a stranger on the street. Let's just learn to listen, smile, say hello, and just uh, be caring to one another. And as for me, ladies and gentlemen, you can catch all the replays of our interviews with top film directors like Vincent, as well as producers and screenwriters, actors, and more on our own YouTube channel, Bond on Cinema. We're available on a dozen audio platforms as well. So I want to thank you for watching and listening. And as for me, I hope to see you at the movies. <laughs>